obligations to the European Union and the Member States to guarantee that all persons with disabilities in the European Union can enjoy the right to vote in EP elections. You will he hear more about it shortly and I strongly encourage you to fully support this opinion. I would like now to introduce the speaker, our speaker for today, uh, Mrs. Sheenat Burke. Through her company, Tilting the Lens, she is working towards accelerating systemic change within the domains of education and design by focusing on accessibility as a vehicle for creativity, innovation and social justice. Sheenat is also a TED speaker. Her talk, Why Design Should Include Everyone, has amassed over 1 million views. Sheenat has addressed the World Economic Forum at Davos and is a member of WEF's Future Cities Council. She is the first little person to feature on the cover of Vogue and to attend the Met Gala, but her interest and work is utilizing her experience of being the first as a case study to make these practices the rule. Sheenat, Mrs. Burke, you have the floor. Thank you very much for having accepted our uh, invitation. Thank you so much, President Cheng, for the invitation to speak today. Guests, those who are members of the committee, I cannot thank you enough, and I'm incredibly humbled by your invitation. The President already detailed some of the history of the disability movement. But on the week of the International Day for Persons with Disabilities, I believe it's important to reflect on where we have come from and the progress that we have made thus far. This may be familiar to many of you. For some of you, this is your life's work. And for others, perhaps this is the first time you have considered this timeline. But the timeline for disability inclusion has not been linear and it differs by jurisdiction. But for many of us, the medical model of disability is within our lived experience, meaning that disabled people were classified by their medical condition and they were spoken about, never spoken with or to. This framing of disability led to the perception that it was a burden on individuals, families, communities and societies. When someone was born disabled, sympathy was whispered. Disabled people were taken from their homes and communities and placed in care homes and institutions. It's better for them and their families, we as a collective said. But did we ever ask disabled people what they want? With disabled people placed in the verges of our communities and with growing economies and democracies, we began to build and design our world. Blueprints for cities and societies emerged without ever considering the needs or accommodations of disabled people. Gradually and thankfully, our thinking began to change. The inclusion of disabled people began a conscious decision, but our methodology was through charity. Charitable organizations populated the landscape and governments abdicated their responsibility and gave large amounts of funding to this sector. In the beginning, it was functional, but positioning disability within charity makes our act of inclusion one rooted in generosity rather than equity, rights and justice. The charitable model cultivated a system wherein charities representing disabled people felt limited in their ability to lobby government to create change. There was fear that it might risk their funding and with so many other charities in existence, those funds could easily be allocated elsewhere. The system once again speaks for disabled people and it created apathy and little progress. In many countries, this cycle continues to exist today. Today though, we aspire to position disability within a disability rights or disability justice model. Many of the countries represented and who will speak today have signed the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Legislation that guarantees a disabled person's right to dignity, to education and to participation in the decision making process, particularly in issues concerning them. However, not all countries, including mine, have ratified the optional protocol, giving disabled people a voice to challenge those in power when their agency is hindered. Still, so many disabled people are silenced. But before going any further, I should introduce myself. My name is Sinead Burke. I should offer a visual description too. I sit speaking with you today from my home in Ireland, 
I live in a small town called Navan, which is about 30 miles outside of Dublin, our capital. I am a white woman. I have brown hair that is typically around ear and kind of chin length, but thanks to the pandemic is a little bit longer beyond my shoulders. I have brown eyes and I am wearing a cream cashmere jumper. I am sitting in front of a blue wall with blinds extended down and a wardrobe. I am an educator and a disabled woman. I have a chondroplasia, the most common form of dwarfism, and I use the vocabulary of little person to describe myself. I'm incredibly proud to be disabled. My disability is one of my identities that defines me, that shapes my expertise and interests and frames my perspective on the world. This became clear to me on the 19th of September, 1994. It was the day of my fourth birthday and my first day of school. I started school 19 days later than everyone else because as a disabled child, there were concerns that my physical disability may have an impact on my educational attainment. I was advised to begin school early, or at least my parents were, so that I would have time if I needed to repeat a year or a specific part of the curriculum. I loved school. The classroom was a safe place for me to discover who I was and what I wanted for my future. I have visceral memories of me running to the classroom library, picking up books from the bookcases and flipping through them, even when I didn't know how to read. I enjoyed the escapism of the imagery and even then understood the power of stories to change the world. I am the product of an inclusive education system, one which many of you voted and fought for. And if I'm a success, it is because I am a loved child. My parents nurtured and nourished me to believe that anything is possible. And although there was little representation of people who looked like me in positions of power and influence, it didn't mean that my ambition should be dependent on that visibility. On my first day of school, I came home and told my parents that I wanted to be a teacher. Even then, I understood that education was a catalyst for change, a vehicle to challenge biases and assumptions and to promote new thinking about what a more inclusive future might look like. But what are the practical implications of being a teacher when you are three feet tall? When I was in college and university, a colleague sat beside me and said, how are you going to do it? How are you going to be a teacher? How will you control the children when even from the earliest of ages, they will be bigger than you? I understood their concerns, but I was alarmed by how they spoke about children. We shouldn't try to control children. We should respect them. But of course there were challenges. I remember my first day of entering into the classroom as the teacher. I was teaching four-year-olds. They came into the room, they took off their jackets and they sat down. We had barely begun before one hand was raised very enthusiastically in the air and they said, why are you so small? It's a really brilliant, logical question. I said, well, why are you so big? They thought about it for a second and said, I'm not sure, I was just born like this. I said, so was I. They said, brilliant. Great. What page are we on? Where are we in the book? So often we don't facilitate conversations like that because we shy away from curiosity and what makes us uncomfortable. But when people were asking questions about my ability to be a teacher, there was a rationale in doing so. Take yourself back to your time in the classroom. Think, how would I reach the blackboard? How would I reach the windows or the blinds or the artwork in order to hang it up? And yes, there were difficulties in terms of the arrangement of the classroom. Children usually sit in groups, maybe the blue group, the green group or something seasonal. So I just redesigned it. I structured my classroom in a U shape so that I could see everybody from standing at the top of the room. But it transformed the culture of the classroom because we were all at eye level. There was an equity to my lens and to their perspective on me. I wasn't the authoritative adult at the top of the room shouting at them. I was speaking equally with them in conversation. It transformed the culture of my classroom totally and created a space in which children felt safe just to be themselves. And I'm sure you're thinking, for those of you who are artistic, how did I hang up the artwork on the wall? It wasn't something I could reach. 
the recommendation that I was given at the time was to ask another adult to do it, perhaps another teacher. But instead, I created opportunities in my classroom where the children themselves were curators of our internal museum and gallery. Every week they would assess the artwork that we did and they would say, gosh, Miss Burke, you really tried, but you're still not very good at this and it cannot go up on the wall. It was teaching my children skills of articulation, of self-assessment and of collaboration and teamwork. Those were skills that wouldn't have been developed if I was a teacher in the way in which everybody expected me to be. But it also gave me an opportunity to think about the needs and the specific accommodations of the children I taught. As a disabled person, I have a different lens and perspective. It allowed me to look at the particular abilities of the children. I was teaching in one of the poorest areas in Dublin. It is well known for the socioeconomic difficulties that exist within that region. I was teaching 12 year old boys. One of the boys attended special education classes in the morning and when he returned to my mainstream class in the afternoon, really struggled with the difficulties of the activities. No matter what language I used, pay attention, concentrate, focus, it didn't seem to permeate with him. I remember learning that the activity that he did at the weekend was bring tourists around Dublin, a time in which that was allowed to happen, around on a horse and carriage. I sat with him and I spoke and I said, can you answer this question for me? When a horse is in a road with traffic, how does it know to avoid the cars? He said, gosh, Miss Burke, they wear their blinkers. And I said, great, will you do something for me? Will you try this exercise and put your blinkers on? He did. I came back and I said, how was it? And he said, it was easy. I realized that I had been using language that I was really familiar with as an adult. My classism was showing. It wasn't language that he understood. And instead of admitting embarrassment and perhaps admitting a lack of intelligence by his definition, it was easier to just demonstrate difficult behavior. We need to find ways to connect with people at their level. The final example that I want to give you was that in that same classroom, one of the most difficult subjects to teach was mathematics. The boys didn't understand the relevance of multiplication and long division within their day-to-day -day lives. So I taught maths by bringing in a local restaurant menu, one that they were very familiar with. I told them the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and I said that Snow White and Prince Charming had gone on a last minute date and had left us 60 euro to buy the dwarfs food. But we had a vegetarian, a vegan, a pescatarian, complicating the activity for those who were more academically able. It gave me a chance to sit with the boys who really struggled. And I said, okay, let's just work out the fries and the chips. One boy who really found maths very difficult said, oh, that's easy. One bag is 250, two bags is a fiver. I said, great. I wrote down the multiplication on the board and he said, what are you doing? I said, that's what you just did. You did maths. He said, no, I did dinner. И така вечеряхме. Знае, че сигурно се усмихвате на този пример. За нас е лесно да се усмихваме, но за него това бе нещо изключително, тъй като той толкова много се затрудняваше с математиката, че трябваше винаги с помощ да се справя с задачите. И сега вече това разделение бе преодоляно. Много хора смятат, че моето увреждане ще ми пречи да бъда добър учител. Но всъщност това е причината да съм чудесен учител, ако мога така да се изразя. Моето увреждане ми помогна. То ми даде познания, които не бих имала в друго яче. Може би съм екстровертна. Понеже увреждането ми е видимо, аз се превръщам в центъра на вниманието. Така добих увереност да се изправям в класната стая, да се превърна в двигател за децата, те да разбират себе си, да разбират света около себе си. Поставянето под въпрос на възможностите на хората с увреждания prove their capacity to get married or to have sexual relationships. I understand that this legislation is rooted in the protection of individuals that we deem to be vulnerable. But when creating such policy and documentation, we must ask who is not in the room. The committee does an incredible job at ensuring that disabled voices are central to so many conversations and decisions. But we continuously need more. We need to create legislation in collaboration, molded and shaped by a person's lived experience. I am not sure if you can tell, but I am nervous speaking to you today. 
I can only speak of my experience and my expertise and ask you to remember that the disability community is broad and intersectional. Disability can be visible and invisible. It spans from chronic illness, disease to mental illness. It can be inherited, acquired, permanent or temporary. The global disability population is one billion people, with many countries stating that one in four or five of their citizens are disabled. That means that most people in this plenary will have a connection to disability. Please leverage that understanding and allow a human-centered approach to guide your focus. It is my first time to speak in Brussels, possibly my last, but even at a distance. And such, I boldly ask you to consider the notion that every issue is a disability issue, be that Brexit, climate change, or migration. With your specific expertise, I ask for your help and offer my participation in thinking through fundamental changes in how we employ disabled people and the legislation and financing that is required to create meaningful opportunities for independent living. I ask you to liaise with your stakeholders, your disabled colleagues, and support them in adaptive, accessible employment practices. It may seem overwhelming, but it can begin by asking potential employees if any accessibility accommodations are required to support their application. Perhaps that's an interpreter at an interview, or for me, a footstool at their desk. I also ask that you speak with your government colleagues and begin to create a more nuanced approach to disabled people and employment. So often disabled people wish to work. The current unemployment rate of disabled people is 50 to 70%. But for disabled people, the medical interventions that they require are costly and can only be affordable through being tied to state benefits. But state benefits can only be maintained through a maximum of a few hours of work per week. It is a cycle that self-perpetuates and one that does not proffer independence, agency, nor does it inspire creativity or add to our economy. But I have hope. The pandemic has shifted our compass and made each of us, as individuals and as a collective, to redefine our value proposition. If there is a positive in the destruction of the virus, it is that this moment has granted an opportunity to redesign our world. As we think about redesigning places and spaces for social distancing, let us too imagine how that could be accessible. Thinking this way will make our towns, cities, countries and communities a safe and equitable invitation for people to be themselves. We must not fall into the trap of describing people as vulnerable. Erasing their humanity and finding a sense of comfort in ostracizing them as we rebuild the economy and recreate our society. It has echoes of the past, one which we have done so much to change. Each of you, as individuals and as collective, has the power to transform the landscape for disabled people. I ask you to do this with them, not for them. Tomorrow is International Day of Disabled Persons, and I am so grateful that you are facilitating this conversation and instigating this debate. But this cannot just be a moment in your calendar. It is a movement that I invite you to join. Gurv Mila Magurv, thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. And I'm so sorry that we are not all together because otherwise you would hear really a loud and clear applause uh, for your speech, which was really, really inspiring. I'm uh, very touched and uh, I encourage you to take a moment to read what, what has been written in the chat and you will see the positive feedback that you got. I'm sure it is not the last time you're speaking in Brussels. Now we have a general debate and uh, we have uh, seven minutes per group. The first one on my list is our Vice President for Communication, Mr. Kilian Lohan, for one minute. Kilian, go ahead. Thank you, President, and thank you very much to Sinead. I just wanted to very briefly thank you, Sinead, for joining us and for using your natural storytelling ability to deliver such a powerful and inspiring speech and for pushing us to continue to work on these issues as we already do, as, as you've recognized, and to push us to continue to do more, as you say. And as the President has said, I have no doubt that this is, will not be your last time speaking in Brussels. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Next speaker on my list is Marie Svolska from Group One for three minutes. Mr. Svolska, please press the speak button. Yes. Can I speak now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Mrs. President, and I will use the possibility to uh, speak Czech. So I'm switching to Czech. Yeah, I'm still moved by the speech of Ms. Burke. And I would like to thank you for your words. It's wonderful to see how active you are in how many areas. You are a model to many. And I'm glad that it is you that we are reminding ourselves of the International Day of the Disabled People. At the UN, the, this day was celebrated for the first time in 1981, which is almost 40 years ago, and the situation of the disabled has changed a lot since then. But there is still a lot of space for improvement. As Krista said, the EU, together with 27 other member states, is party to the uh, agreement. It is not binding. That means many countries, as well as the EU, uh, they are not bound to protecting the rights as they are listed in the convention. So in our committee, we deal with these issues. We have a thematic group for that. It has hearings, it has visits to member states, and it is trying to find out how we fulfill the criteria, the requirements. Disabled people are often at a disadvantage in their rights, and they have to overcome many barriers. It is very difficult for them to find a job, to live independently, and to educate themselves. And now, during the pandemic, it seems that the disadvantage is growing bigger. So what we need to do for the disabled, there are several examples. We need to include them in events where there are decisions being made about them. They need information accessible. They need health care and social care as well as other citizens without a disability. As Sinead said, a problem is also in the institutions. Now, during the pandemic, it turns out that people uh, who are either elderly or disabled, they are being isolated and they were also often also infected much more frequently. They should be able to choose whether they want to live independently or in an institution. Another point that has been mentioned, and I want to point it out, is the inclusion in jobs. Finding employment is much more difficult for the disabled. As for education, students with a disability should have access to it. If it's possible, we also need to provide equipment, technologies, or access to the internet. And also we need to support their parents. There's another chapter that is special, and that's women and girls with a disability who are being discriminated against based on their gender as well as the disability. And another issue is uh, voting, the right to vote and to be voted for in the EP. We will still talk about this. Thank you again, and I wish you a lot of health and a lot of success in all your endeavors and your personal life. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Next speaker is President of Group 2, Oliver Röpke, for one minute. Oliver. Thank you, President. And dear Ms. Berg, I would like to welcome you also on behalf of the Workers' Group to this plenary session. And I can tell you that we are really pleased that you are today on the eve of this important day, that you are with us. And first and foremost, I would like to thank you for your impressive and really moving speech you delivered here. And I can assure you, from my personal point of view, there was only one thing missing. I would have liked to applaud to this. And I think it's the same for all the colleagues here in the room or remotely connected uh, at home. Uh, I can assure you that this House 
uh, has always been committed to the rights of persons with disabilities and also especially my group, the workers' group. Uh, we stick and we commit, we are committed to the principle of equality, of equal rights and of inclusiveness. And we know that people with disabilities are in particular affected by the health, social and economic consequences of COVID-19. So we need, uh, we know you need our support and I wanted to take only one minute in order to leave enough space for other colleagues. Just one final remark. There is, as you know, the European pillar of social rights, and we know that there's also a very strong principle on inclusion that promotes the integration of people with disabilities. And I can assure you, we will insist on a proper implementation of this pillar of social rights, because I think the rights also for persons with disabilities have to be tangible. We will fight for this, and I think the whole House is committed to this. Once again, thank you very much for being with us, and all the best for you and for your work. Thank you, Mr. Barbieri. Italy Group 3 for two minutes. Uh, I'll talk in my body tongue. Um, grazie. Thank you, President. Thank you for giving me the floor. And I would like to thank Sinead on behalf uh, of uh, the uh, Disability Study Group uh, for the extraordinary presentation she made. And there are a few aspects I would like to emphasize uh, in the areas that you broached. First of all, the value of inclusive education. To go to a school together with everyone else means that you're laying the foundation for living in the future alongside others. And along with one of the uh, central questions that, that we should be dealing with, yeah, not just a pre-COVID, but also in the post-COVID era. A second aspect I would like to cover is the issue of vulnerability. This is a word that often uh, is used in the European institutions, uh, but we need to change that because vulnerable people are excluded. They're marginalized, uh, they're sidelined, but they're not fragile. And I think that's a, a point that needs to be made uh, very, very strongly with a strong conviction. And another point uh, that was raised on the sidelines in Sinead's uh, presentation, I refer to the subject of protection. And uh, we know that this is often translated into the form of special care homes. Uh, and of course, in the time of a pandemic, uh, well, we're, we weren't able to protect uh, the health uh, of the people uh, in hospitals, uh, uh, people with uh, chronic diseases, uh, and etc. Quite the opposite, in fact. Uh, so maybe we need to challenge that model throughout Europe uh, and when we see what it caused. And I would also thank the President uh, for having been willing to have this session and uh, for this presentation, which I think really, really does uh, justice uh, uh, to the subject of disability right now. We really do need another model, another way of speaking to the European Commission on the European strategy uh, that uh, uh, really does have meaning. Thank you. Lei, uh, Martina Sirhalova for two minutes, group one. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Harlow, please go on. Yes, please continue. Okay. Dear Mrs. Burke, I would like to warmly welcome you in our committee, even if it's only remotely in these difficult times for everybody. It is real pleasure to have you among us. Looking at what you have achieved is impressive. Just a so short search on internet shows how powerful you are. I have the feeling that you have an energy of two women. I admire you. All women would agree with me that fashion and feeling comfortable in things you are wearing are for us very important. It doesn't matter if you have some kind of disability or not. And this is the issue. We should not even think that there is a difference between people with disabilities and others. Everybody must have equal opportunities. 
Here we can assure you that the European Economic and Social Committee is dealing with many topics that are related to any kind of ex exclusion. We strongly reject disability-based discrimination. I can invite you to read our opinions. Many of them are own initiative opinions, which proves that this topic is of big importance for us. I am more than happy to point out the opinion of our colleague Ancha Gunta. She wrote an exploratory opinion requested by the European Parliament, which is dedicated to the situation of women with disabilities. In that opinion, it was emphasized that women with disabilities should actively participate in the EU election, not only as voters, but also as candidates. She requested to include disability perspective in its gender equality strategy, policies and programs, and a gender perspective in its disability strategies, including the future European Disability Strategy 2020-2030 and the European Pillar of Social Rights. Do not forget, I know that I am not the only one who is proud of paper of Mr. Pater dealing with real rights of persons with disabilities to vote in European Parliament elections. At the end, I cannot jump over the information that you are the first little person on the cover of Vogue. It is not just a photo. There is a story behind. You are a symbol who gives a hope to people. This story has been delivered to many people. I really wish you from deep of my heart a lot of success in the work you are doing. Thank you very much, Martina. Pierre Jean Coulon, please, three minutes uh, uh, from, from group two. Group two. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Chair. And thank you to Sinead for bearing witness, witness of a life which has been really devoted to, com to fighting for recognition, not of a disability only, but of a difference. And I'd like to spend the two and a half minutes left to me uh, discussing something which is very specific. Apart from the uh, pious wishes and uh, asser ass assertions, legitimate assertions, we have to do everything we can to uh, make sure that um, things change. And I can give you an example. Services of general interest. Transport. Access to accommodation, housing, digital these are things where we always have to bear in mind the need to take into account the needs of people with disabilities. When we uh, set up, uh, launch new transport uh, measures, transport measures, uh, either within cities or between cities or uh, for air, airlines, uh, public transport, it's legitimate and mandatory to take into account the dimension of people with disabilities. When the upcoming consideration is going to take place about housing, accessible housing, clean housing, when we discuss that, when we renovate hundreds of millions of uh, housing units in Europe, we have to take into account the needs of people with disabilities. It's only in this way that we will succeed. Otherwise, it's just blah, blah, just um, talking for the sake of talking. We have to contribute to taking into account the needs of people with disabilities. When we talk about access to uh, 3G, 4G, 5G, we have to take account of that dimension. Uh, mobility handic uh, uh, disabilities are one thing, um, and intellectual disabilities are other, uh, cognitive disabilities, and we always have to bear all of these in mind in our work. Thank you once more, Ms. Burke. You said to us just now that everything is possible, and I think it is possible if we um, ensure that we have the resources, and we, very modestly, in our committee, in the work which we do, we must always bear in mind in all our opinions, this uh, issue of people with disabilities. You can count on us. We will uh, modestly do our work in order to allow people who are different from others to have the same access to all services. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. Vadakastanis, uh, group three for two minutes, please. Thank you, dear president. As um, an activist in the disability movement for many years, and also in my capacity as president of the European Disability Forum, I would like to congratulate Ms. Berg for the way she has dealt with the issue she has presented. But the 3rd of December of this year is a very unusual 3rd of December. It is in the middle of the second wave of the pandemic. And I would like to dedicate this intervention to one million persons with disabilities in Europe living in residential institutions to those who are at home alone, to the families that have lost their loved ones in the first wave and in all this period of the pandemic, to those that are suffering the devastating effects disproportionately than other parts of the population. They suffer from the pandemic, but also persons with disabilities suffer from neglect. Neglect by those who take decisions. And uh, let me also say this. Now that the vaccination begins, we should ask, and I propose, Mrs. President, that this committee, our committee, asks the European Commission to reconsider the vaccination rollout and to prioritize persons with disabilities in the vaccination rollout in the member states. And I close with this. As they were saying in America, Black Lives Matter, I say also, the lives of persons with disabilities matter as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Maria, for two minutes, President of Group One. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Burke, for um, exchanging your views and ideas with us in such a, a sincere and, uh, and transparent manner. Um, uh, I also want to congratulate you on the recently published book, which I understand also won um, uh, the prize of Book of the Year for 2020. So sincere, sincere congratulations for that. Um, I represent employers. I represent employers across, um, across Europe. My group, uh, we are 106 members, and therefore we cover, you can say, all of Europe. And uh, one of the aspects which, of course, interests me on this, on this particular topic is um, uh, the integration of people with disability into the labor market. Now, some years ago, I personally was involved in politics. And one of the aspects that I was covering at that time was, in fact, the, um, uh, the possibilities of, of people, being, uh, people with disability being employed and the difficulties being faced. And uh, because of that, I visited uh, a number of households um, where I met, um, you can say, a number of youths with disability. And one of the things that struck me was the incredible difficulty they have even of getting out of their home, but getting out of their home from a mental, from a mental point of view. And one of the major barriers that I saw was also the parents and the difficulties that parents had of accepting that they should let their youngsters out of the house. And I think this highlights very, very starkly um, some of the difficulties that, are that, that people with disability face um, uh, to enter the labor market. I feel that uh, it is our responsibility as employers to create the right environment for people with disability who want to work um, to be able to do so and to be able to do so in a very seamless and uh, uh, untroubled manner. But equally, um, it is important that policymakers, governments, European institutions, that we create the right environment for people with disability to be able to 
come out into the labor market, to be able to upskill themselves and to be able to um, engage in continuous learning at will and without any kinds of barriers. Today is the International Day of Persons with Disability. But the reality is that um, we should be dealing with making it possible for people with disability to enter the labor market every single day. And from our end, this is something that from the European uh, Employers Group, this is something which we are committed to. Thank you, and I wish you sincerely all the best for your future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madame Nicolopoulou, uh, three minutes. Muchísimas gracias, Presidenta. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you, Sinead, for coming here. I have to confess that it's difficult for me to use the word uh, handicap. There's a great deal of discussion about what the politically correct term is to use, how we should address ourselves to people who have uh, special needs. And I think the linguistic problem is partly due to the fact that the um, uh, respect for people who have different uh, needs um, is enormous. So we can't uh, uh, lump together people who have uh, physical disabilities, those who have uh, cognitive disabilities or uh, congenital disabilities, different levels of and degrees of disability. These are all things which I'd like to stress. We're very um, happy to uh, hear Sinead talk about independence. We think this is a priority. It's important to give everybody um, the possibility of uh, being able to work, live alone and lead their own lives. And until we normalise, uh, have a social normalisation of this reaction of employing people with disabilities, then... Uh, and we, uh, we, then we will need these active policies for integration uh, of these such people into the labour market. And then there are other people who may not be able to hold down a job. And for them, too, we need uh, st uh, structures which enable them to integrate into society. Another point I'd ra like to raise is that the history of a person with disabilities is very closely tied to the family history. The person with disabilities um, is somebody who has a family behind them and often uh, they try to cater for the needs of the disability and we see that without support of families, in particular women who often overlook their own uh, needs or aspirations, personal asp aspirations, in order to help someone else, without the support of such women, such families, many people would not be able to uh, go, go forward. And then there's the adaptations that we have to make at social level. When a woman decides to leave behind her own needs and aspirations in order to help someone else, if she's doing it for uh, her own convictions, then fine. But if she's doing it because there's no other way out, there's no structure, there's no support structure, which would be essential in order for the, uh, p the other person to succeed, then I think we really need to intervene and to ensure that those s uh, structures are put in place. Thank you very much, Madame Injova. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you for your um, incredible human approach uh, and your positive reinforcement toward people with disability. And of course, uh, thank you for accepting people with disability as a cause in your priority line. Um, Ms. Burke, it, it was absolutely incredible and inspiring what you said in your incredible presentation. And it, you're giving really a new approach to our uh, how we have to fight for a better life of people with disability. And it's interesting to understand what is happening uh, and why we have this International Day of People with Disability. Uh, this year, for instance, the focus is uh, not all disabilities are visible. And it's really incredible to understand that sometime the internal disability, the mental disabilities are absolutely 
important to be included as well, to be supported, to be integrated into the mainstream life. And often organizations of people with disability are saying, yeah, we did sign the convention, we ratified it, but nothing is changed. And the life of people with disability is really difficult. So the human factor is very important. And that's why our house, European Economic and Social Committee, it's very important institutions. And uh, I'm very proud that all members in all of their opinions are supporting people with disability. And especially in this great uh, opinion that you're going to vote in a minute, uh, of course, of pattern, it's something incredible. Um, thank you and humbly, I would like to say you're really leaders in Europe because you're giving hope to people with disability. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor back to Mrs. Burke uh, to give us her re and to reply to everything she has heard so far. Sheena, please go ahead. Ms. Burke, please press the speak button. My sincerest apologies, getting used to the technology. This is Sinead speaking once again. Thank you to all of those who contributed such wonderful insights and for the kind words that you allowed me to calm and settle my nerves. There are specific points that I wanted to return to. Mr. Barbieri made such a wonderful and important contribution in relation to the language surrounding vulnerable and fragile. I think it's really important that we acknowledge the necessity that we each position ourselves within a space of vulnerability, acknowledging that we do not know what we do not know. I give this example when returning to the classroom. One of my most favorite moments of teaching was when a child raised their hand to ask a question, a question that I did not know the answer to. And I said as such, he couldn't believe it. He said, what do you mean you don't know? You are the teacher. And I said, yes, but there are limits to my knowledge and lived experience in the same way that there is for everybody. Let's work together to find a solution. In a place like this house, there is often an assumption that you as individuals and as a collective know everything, but that is, a literal impossibility. I ask you to position yourselves within a space of vulnerability, acknowledge the aspects of the world that you have been blinkered to, and to collaborate with those individuals, particularly with disabled people, in order to work for it. I think the language surrounding disabled people in the pandemic has been utilised under this framework of vulnerability. It gives us permission to think of those individuals as fragile. And whilst we must acknowledge the vulnerabilities that exist within society, there is such an opportunity to other individuals, to make them less with our use of language. And it's something that we need to be really careful of, particularly if our attempt is to be one of protectivism. Let's not look to protect people. Let's look to give them rights, independent living and agency. Mr. Halova, and my apologies if I mispronounced your surname, made a really brilliant contribution in talking about the spectrum of disability and how in an idyllic scenario, we would not see difference. The difference may not exist because we all have a spectrum and an accommodation of needs that are required. I really appreciate this perspective and opinion, but I would love for us to think broader too. I would love to, uh, for us to consider this from a lens of equity and equality. There is a difference in those two. Looking for equal participation is something we all desire for. But I would ask instead that we look for participation that is rooted in equity. Again, to give you a childhood example in order to think of one that you may be familiar with. I'd like you to take yourself back to your school days, thinking about the sports day. When I was participating in a race in school, it was understood that for, in order for it to be fair for me, that the whistle would be blown earlier for me. I could get a head start. I would start 10 seconds earlier than everybody else. Due to my disability, I couldn't run as fast as the people I went to school with. It wasn't an unfair advantage. It was just equalizing the playing field so that everybody else had a fair opportunity to participate. Now that is a childlike example, but it is a case study that we can bring into our work here in this house and in society at large. We don't just want to think of these things through, through equality, but through equity. And that requires resources, a new way of thinking and a new way of doing business. Mr. Coulomb, you made some incredibly important points, particularly in relation to services of general. I ask this house to really take on that mandate in thinking about housing and transport specifically. I speak to you today from my family home. 
I am 30 years old and continue to live at home because renting is really difficult in terms of accessibility. There is no building standard that allows for a specific height on the lock of a door, which means that if I rent a property, I may not be able to exit or enter that property with independence. I may have to ask someone for help, but what if there is a fire? What if there is an emergency? I am trapped in a building that I live in due to a lack of consideration of accessibility. I also ask you to think about the historic legislation around protected buildings, where we place an emphasis over the beauty of the architecture rather than the ability for disabled people to access. I understand for many people, the rationale is that by adding lifts, by adding ramps, by adding accommodations, we deter the level of beauty and aesthetic that is on that building. However, ramps, elevators and lifts are designed ugly because it was a physical act of designing them to be so. They were not designed with dignity and with form in mind, but we can change that. How can we ensure that with our legislation and policy, particularly around buildings and older buildings, that we do not place the priority of architecture over people? I'm very grateful that I can count on you to use those resources to think broadly about that division. Mr. Verstakinis, you talked about the impact of the pandemic and the need for this house to think about the prioritization of people with disabilities for vaccinations. I think you're absolutely right. But I would ask us to also acknowledge that for so many disabled people, particularly those who are chronically ill, we need to have broader discussions about how such vaccinations may affect their conditions. That is not to prosper or to encourage anti-vaccination rhetoric, but understanding that we are in a space and an era of the unknown, and we must consider the nuances within this agreement. Mr. Malia, you spoke about the labour market and the biases that exist, and how do we create the right environment? As a very beginning step, I would ask you to not say that you welcome diversity or that you welcome disability. That places the onus on the person who is the other, the marginalized or the minority voice, in order to fit within the environment that you have curated for the needs of those who already exist within that workspace. Instead, we must explicitly invite disabled people to those workplaces. How do they know that they are accessible or equitable or that you have considered their accommodations? I would ask you to create partnerships and relationships with disabled people organizations in various different regions to encourage them to leverage their experience and their network to provide you with all sorts of disabled talent who may be able to participate in your workforce. So often we say that dis disabled talent doesn't exist, but that's often because we're not looking in the right places or not using the correct language. Speaking of language, and Miss Nicola Pulu, excuse me, you spoke about the stigma of language. I think it's important that we acknowledge that language doesn't just name our society, it shapes it. And as you said, there is a stigmatization to the language surrounding disability. I've been on a very personal journey as regards to language. In my early adolescence, I used to describe myself as just Sinead and as the language that I preferred people to use. But I began to realize that as I tried to access buildings and began to try to reach doorbells or figured that I couldn't get in and out safely, there was no legislation that provided for accessibility for just Sinead. In my late teens, I began to describe myself as a person with a disability, which is the language you use to celebrate a day like tomorrow. But what I was doing was I was attaching stigma to the disability aspect of that language. I was asking people to just see me as a person with a disability. But my disability has shaped all aspects of me. I would not be speaking to you today if I was not disabled. I would not be a teacher, nor would I be interested in fashion, nor would I be doing work in this advocacy space. So I now proudly describe myself as a disabled person. And I think we have moved into identity first language in order to cultivate pride and to remove stigma. You, very importantly, talked about language such as special needs. The language of special needs has come from the non-disabled communities, specifically parents who are often trying to grapple with the stigmatization of the language of disability, that instead they chose special needs. But I question if that language infantilizes the accommodations that are needed, if it places our needs in a way in which could be considered optional. My needs aren't special. They are protected by rights, rights which must be adhered to. 
We also talk about different abilities. And I ask, why are we so afraid of the language of disability? I would ask that using the resources that this house has, we think about language in a way that is powerful and that will create pride and agency too. Language is political, but it's deeply personal. And even me, as a person who uses language such as little people, many in my community may disagree. I think it's important on an individual level that we ask people what language they are most comfortable with and adopt that vocabulary in a modern era that it may be considered political correctness. But I think the obligation of using language that makes other people feel safe is the very least we can do as human beings in a society. I think you're absolutely right to raise the issue of the family history of disability and the role of female co-workers. I think there is a natural friction sometimes between the relationship of disabled people and caregivers. In mainstream society, caregivers are not given a voice and the only space in which they're usually given space to speak is for the disabled person that they work with and serve. But disabled people need places to have their own voice too. I think we need to create a new type of culture where caregivers and disabled people are given greater access to broader conversations and are rewarded for the respite and care that they give. And finally, Ms. Njova, you spoke about the lack of progress that exists around this issue. There have been many times in today's conversation where the word tokenism was even considered, that often this is an issue, particularly at this time of year, in which we celebrate conversations around access and disability. But it's not enough. I ask you that by this time next year, there is progress that is tangible and measurable that you will be able to announce at a celebration like this. It is so important that we don't just facilitate conversation, but we move from listening to action as soon as possible. But I have great confidence that if any house within Brussels can participate in the mobilization to action, it is you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today and for to respond to so many of these excellent contributions. Thank you. Dear Mrs. Berg, dear colleagues, um, allow me to say, and I'm sure that I'm talking on behalf of each and everybody of us, uh, that you are a true inspiration and that you convinced us of the importance of accessibility. Because accessibility enables people with disabilities to fully participate and contribute with their talents in all fields of society. We saw that many challenges for persons with disability remain to be tackled and the road ahead is still long. But I feel that each and everybody of us can contribute to advancing disability rights, be it, raising, be it by raising awareness, advocating or engaging politically. Thank you very much for being with us today and thank all the members for their contributions to the debate. We now move on to the next item on our agenda, which is uh, an opinion by Mr. Pater concerning uh, the rights for persons with disabilities to vote in European Parliament elections. And I immediately give the floor to Mr. Pater. This opinion is a follow-up to the EC Info.